Hello, my name is Ellen Elias. I'm a professor of pediatrics and genetics in Colorado at Children's Hospital. And uh, my area of expertise is uh, medical management for children with uh, complicated medical problems and underlying genetic disorders. Today, we're going to talk about when one should suspect the diagnosis of fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva, or FOP for short. What are the clinical signs and, and cardinal um, physical findings that might help you suspect this very rare diagnosis? So I'm going to start off with on a, on a positive note with one of the most transformative things I've seen in the field of FOP for many uh, years, and that is... Um, this this law which was promulgated in Brazil at the beginning of this year, you can see it on the 9th of January of this year, a law was passed in Brazil. And I'll, I don't know how many of you speak Portuguese, but I'll draw your attention to uh, the center of the slide where, where you can see that the law is about fiber dysplasia ossificante progressiva. Um, and just bear this in mind that there's a country in the world where there's a law on FOP, and we'll get to what that law says a little bit later on in the proceedings. Now, I understand that you're all busy clinicians. We all uh, are, and we all actually have many uh, different interests outside of uh, specific rare diseases. Um, but this is a philosophy that I like to, to follow. It was uh, something, a phrase coined by Thomas Huxley, who was incidentally the grandfather of Aldous Huxley, uh, uh, who, um, who was also the founder of Nature Journal, the Nature Journal that we all appreciate so much. And he had a philosophy that one should try to learn something about everything and everything about something. So this is perhaps a situation where you as a generalist can learn something uh, about FOP without having to know everything about it. But we hope that what you will learn will be impactful in your clinical practice. So I'll start off by asking you a clinical question. Just what, what would you do when you are referred a child such as this, one of these two children with lumps on their back or on the back of their heads? Um, one might be forgiven for thinking that these painful, firm lumps um, could represent some kind of malignancy or a dangerous abscess or something like that. Uh, one might even be for or given for considering a referral to a surgeon or an oncologist to, to try and have these unusual presentations sorted out. But in the case of this condition, fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva, or FOP, that referral could potentially be disastrous. And there's a much easier way to make the diagnosis early on. So what do you know about the toes in fibrodysplasia Ossificans progressiva. Uh, Ellen, I don't know if you want to. Um, absolutely. So as pediatricians, we have the ability to look at the whole body of our patients um, and they're, they might be coming in for a sore throat or an earache. But um, as a geneticist, I've learned that it's really important to look at the whole body. And that means taking the socks off and looking at the toes because the uh, abnormalities that one sees in how toes are formed in this condition is the first early clue of, about what might be going on. Um, and so it's really important to always take a look at toes. Um, and if you see something that looks unusual to you, um, then um, you might want to... Um, just stop and wait and think, okay, this child has some unusual lumps that are firm and hard, plus some funky looking toes. And does this mean something? So it's actually critically important to make a correct diagnosis of FOP early on. Not only can you treat the child correctly if that happens, you can um, 
have an explanation for what might be a painful process and treat the patient appropriately for pain. You can also reduce unnecessary worry in doctor's appointments. For example, patients might be um, petrified that they might have some kind of a tumor um, if they have a lump, but it's not a tumor at all. And one of the very, very important um, things that we would like to convey in this talk is the necessity of not performing any kind of surgical procedures on a child with FOP because that can lead to significant um, uh, progression of the FOP disease. And making a diagnosis um, can just lead to proper management and, and therapy that is now available for this very rare disease. So I wanted to just um, let Dr. Um, Scott explain this very interesting slide and then tell you a story about what I mean about preventing harm um, in medicine and what we do. Dr. Scott. Thanks, Dr. Elias. Indeed, I think what, you, what you've mentioned about the diagnosis is so critical. Um, and as a geneticist who sees many different kinds of rare diseases, I'm sure you'll agree that the 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 difficulty for family in not knowing the diagnosis is one of the really troubling components of FOP. And so in this desperation to find a diagnosis, people might resort to all, all kinds of uh, avenues. And in the case of FOP, if someone ends up uh, with a physician who wants to uh, do a biopsy, for instance, to, to diagnose FOP, one could take a child who was previously running around playing um, until their third or fourth birthday as a happy child and send them to a wheelchair or a, or a life of severe disability very early on. One could also, if one inadvertently performed dental procedures that might involve the master muscle, one could sentence a child who was previously eating happily and healthily, as you can see there, a nice big hamburger, uh, one can sentence that child to a life where they're no longer able to open their mouth at all, ever again, uh, which is really one of the most horrific things that can happen to a child. I wonder, Dr. Elias, uh, Elias if you can uh, uh, speak to us about uh, some of the examples you've seen. Absolutely. So I wanted to to have a very compelling story about one of my patients with FOP, uh, which really drives home the importance of making a diagnosis as early as one can. So I have been following um, a young woman who's now in her mid-20s, but when she was um, a young girl of around 10, um, she had had some small lumps here and there, but she developed a very firm lump in the middle of her right upper arm, right in the middle of her humerus. And her pediatrician was very concerned about that lump and was worried that it could be an osteosarcoma. And for that reason, referred her um, to see an orthopedic um, surgeon to do a biopsy to rule out cancer. So this uh, child underwent um, that biopsy, turned out it was not cancer. Um, and as a consequence of that surgical procedure, she developed severe heterotopic ossification. So she developed bone where there should not be bone. Uh, which can which progressed incredibly rapidly. And what happened to this child from a small biopsy in the middle of her um, right upper arm, she developed a bony bridge that connected her right arm to her anterior chest so that she was no longer able to move that arm at all. And her scapula in the back on the right became attached by a bony bridge to her posterior rib cage. But that wasn't all. She also developed um, abnormal bone that went all the way down the right side of her thorax, um, involving her right hip and into her uh, right thigh. And she lost her ability to ambulate and is now 
confined to a wheelchair. So this um, healthy and active child, just from one small bone biopsy, became completely encapsulated in bone on her right side. Um, and that was a problem that could have been averted had someone actually looked at her toes first. Thanks for that example. And I think that mirrors exactly what I experienced with the first patient with FOP that I encountered, a very similar um, story. And that's actually what motivated me and I'm sure motivates you to, to do this kind of awareness raising about these toes. Um, the toes of FOP are very specific. Um, I wonder if you want to talk us through the features of, of these abnormal toes that we can see. Um, so it, it's the big toe predominantly that's impacted uh, in this condition. And there are several things that one can see, and it can go from being quite obvious to being a little bit more subtle. But um, first of all, the toe appears shorter than the other toes. And instead of the big toe being uh, um, usually as long as the second toe, um, it, it appears much shorter and it's sort of originating a little bit more proximally in the foot. Um, the toe also tends to be deviated laterally. Uh, we call that hallux valgus. Um, and so the toe is short, starts too early in the foot, and turns out to the side. And I think you can see sort of different levels of severity of that in these pictures from these different um, children. So often the toe, if you do x-rays, is missing um, the middle phalanx. Um, and, and that's part of the reason why the toe appears um, much shorter. Um, you can sometimes see more subtle um, abnormalities in the hands and thumbs as well, but it's really the toes that um, is the big, big clue about what is going on. Um, so if you ever, ever see a child with unusual lumps um, that are hard, they're hard because it's abnormal bone there. Um, you must take off the socks and look at toes. And if you see toes that look like this, then your suspicion should be uh, raised significantly that you're dealing with a patient with FOP. Thank you. So, I mean, I completely agree. And you've described the toes beautifully. Um, and the message that I want to reiterate is that if you see that combination of the malformed toes and the tumor-like swellings, Usually it's the tumor-like swellings that present to the pediatrician, although in many cases, uh, malformed toes are noted at the early in life. They're often disregarded and overlooked. Um, I've even seen some patients who's ha who've had their toes straightened uh, surgically at a very young age before presenting later on with the tumor-like swellings that were the harboring of, of FOP. Um, so the differential diagnosis for things that give you abnormal toes and swollen lumps is very, very small. I want to show you an interesting example uh, on the right of uh, of how the diagnosis can be made. In this case, uh, several centuries earlier, this man presented and was described in a book that I inherited from my grandfather called The Anomalies and Curiosities of Medicine. I'm sure Dr. Uh, Ill um, Elias will be very interested in uh, in paging through that book. Um, but there are many examples of things that we know nowadays that were rare diseases. And one of the things I came across in this book, uh, which was published in the 1800s, uh, recounted the story uh, of a man with who was, who was known as the ossified man. And you can see there that he was described as having ankylosis of the articulations. And uh, it was very obvious when one just zoomed in on, on the slide from the ossified man uh, that one could identify his abnormal toes in valgus and shortened as was just beautifully described. And so that leaves us in no doubt that this, uh, this man suffered from FOP. Um, so the, the first step in diagnosing FOP and the reason we're passionate about this message is that one should not do a harmful procedure. That is our first oath 
um, and one that is easy to to inadvertently um, um, uh, 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 incur harm for a patient if one doesn't know about FOP. Uh, and if one knows about the toes of FOP, it's very much easier to avoid this, this harm. So the reason we say that is when you do a biopsy, if someone does a biopsy on FOP muscle, the end result is ossification, increased ossification uh, in the area that was damaged. And that muscle that instead of being re is replaced with, uh, with muscle again, will be replaced by cartilage and then bone, as you'll see when we talk about the pathophysiology. And so it's for this reason that if any trauma to any muscle in the body can result in ossification of that skeletal muscle, um, interestingly, ocular muscles are not involved, the diaphragm and the heart are not involved, the intestinal muscles are not involved, but every other muscle in the body can become ossified uh, and develop uh, heterotopic ossification, leading to the de destruction of the function of that muscle. Um, and so, for instance, a mandibular block can lead to ossification of the masseter muscle and uh, locking the jaw, as we described with, with the hamburger, and as Dr. Elias has described with the with the removal of that tumor in the humerus, uh, that set off a cascade of, of severe ossific, heterotopic ossification, which led to immobilization in, in, in her patient's case of many joints. Um, and here you can see an example of a child who was immunized uh, intramuscularly, uh, and this led to ossification of, of the right hip. Uh, and you can see how that hip is locked in and tethered by a bony bridge analogous to the uh, humerus that was earlier described, this this is locked onto the pelvis and that child will never ever move that hip again, not an inch. One of the um, other stories I wanted to discuss for a minute, um, as Dr. Scott mentioned, the um, muscles anywhere can be impacted and can present with this painful process where you develop um, ossification, we call that a flare. So it commonly can be on the torso, can be on the long bones, but there are also muscles internally um, that can be uh, impacted as well. And one of my patients um, developed a flare, a painful um, lesion of the iliopsoas muscle in the right side of the pelvis. And the presentation of this pain really mimicked acute appendicitis. And the surgeons were wanting to do surgery because they thought this child had a ruptured um, appendix. And I said, wait, stop, no. Um, this child has these abnormal toes, had a, um, a molecularly proven um, variant in the gene causing FOP, which we'll discuss in just a moment. But um, on a CT scan, we were able to appreciate um, heterotopic abnormal ossification of this iliopsoas muscle, and we we're able to treat that child with pain medication and steroids that um, uh, treated the symptoms of right lower quadrant pain, saved that child um, a surgical procedure that could have been absolutely devastating and lead um, to the um, horrible ossification of all the surrounding um, tissue and joints uh, that might have occurred had a surgical procedure been done. So making this diagnosis early and correctly is so important to avoid um, all kinds of trauma that might induce heterotopic ossification. 